I'm happy to be able to speak in this house once again. I do so for the first time on this side of the aisle, and that makes me doubly happy. Sir, it is maiden speech. I welcome the. Fifteen minutes only. Maiden speech. Maiden speech is only fifteen minutes. I welcome the. I welcome the friendly and conciliatory tone of the honourable finance minister's speech. I think the tone and approach has changed over the last three or four weeks and that augurs well for this bill. Although it will depend upon the outcome of this debate and the assurances that the government is able to give on many issues which he himself hinted are still outstanding issues and need to be resolved. So if I may say in a lighter vein, between 2011 and 2014, I did virtually was what was called a chardam, traveling between my Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition in the Lok Sabha, the leader of the opposition in the Rajya Sabha, and the empowered Council of Finance Ministers. We tried to pass a GST bill with the support of the principal opposition party, and we failed. In the last about 18 months, the government tried to pass it without the support of the principal opposition party, and I'm glad you also failed. <laughs> Today, if we pass this bill, as I hope we will, and after we listen to your speech, it will be on the basis of serious discussions, serious negotiations, and serious debate. This is far too important a legislation to be passed on a partisan basis. In fact, I commented once, I hope the finance minister will pass the bill not on the strength of numbers, but on the strength of his arguments. So I'm glad that the finance minister acknowledged that it was the UPA government which first officially announced government's intention to bring about a GST. On 28th of February 2005, it was announced in the Lok Sabha in the course of the budget speech, and I quote, in the medium to long term, it is my goal that the entire production distribution chain should be covered by a national VAT, or even better, a goods and services tax encompassing both the center and the states." Unquote. It has, of course, taken us 11 years to arrive at this point, but I think the journey has been a learning experience for everyone. So let me make it very clear that the Congress party was never opposed to the idea of a GST. In fact, I believe about an hour ago, the finance minister said so much in an interview to a television channel, and I thank him for making that acknowledgement. We were never opposed to the idea of a GST. We are not discussing or debating the idea of a GST. That debate has gone on in this country for several years, and I think the country is now ready to embrace the idea of a GST. Just as the 2011 GST bill introduced by Mr. Mukherjee was opposed by several parties, including the BJP, the 2014 bill is being opposed. The idea was not opposed, the bill was opposed. Because we felt that it was possible to have a more perfect bill. And I choose my words carefully. There can be no such thing as a perfect bill. And in a legislation as transformative and as revolutionary as the goods and services tax, I don't think anyone from the government side will claim that this is a perfect bill. It can never be a perfect bill. But when we found that there were too many flaws in the bill, 
and many of those flaws could be fixed by addressing them seriously, we decided that we cannot support the bill. <laughs> I'm happy that in the last few weeks, there has been a serious engagement by the government with the opposition parties, including my party, and I'm glad that considerable progress has been made. Sir, there are four major issues. I will touch briefly upon the first three issues because it is the last issue that concerns me most and I want to take my time dealing with that at some length. The first is, I wish to point out to the Honorable Finance Minister that there are still pieces of clumsy drafting in this bill. For example, you have in the present list of amendments circulated, you have made some provisions of what will go into the Consolidated Fund of India and what will not go into the Consolidated Fund of India. This problem should have been noticed much earlier. It should have come in the draft bill. But it has come today in the form of an amendment and while I will not take too much time explaining what I have in mind, if the Honorable Finance Minister reads it more carefully, he will find that these are exquisite pieces of clumsy drafting. Revenue has to go into a consolidated fund. That is the mandate of Article 266 of the Constitution. It has to either go into the Consolidated Fund of India or the Consolidated Fund of a State. It cannot go nowhere. And I'm afraid the draft amendment circulated leaves this question unanswered. I can understand the problem that you faced. I think, to the best of my understanding, the problem was how do you avoid double counting? But I think there was a more elegant way of dealing with the problem of double counting. I think the draft is clumsy. Maybe it can't be rectified at this stage when we are in the final stages of debating the bill. But I would just add a word of caution that the drafting in this respect is rather clumsy. The second issue was I think an issue that could have been resolved in five minutes. How can you in a destination based tax have a retrograde provision like some states being allowed to impose an additional 1%? What is the rationale of a GST? A rationale of a GST is we must avoid multiplicity of taxes. We must avoid cascading of taxes and we must be able to capture every taxable transaction. If you give to some states the power to impose an additional 1% tax, and in the bill that was circulated, it could have been imposed by more than one state, as goods pass from state A to B to C to D. It would have led to multiplicity of tax rates, it would have led to cascading and it would have led to a situation where several transactions may or may not be captured. This was immediately pointed out. But I think the government was, I think during that time, not today, rather stubborn. The chief economic advisor of the government pointed out that this was a retrograde provision and this should be scrapped. And I'm happy that this has been scrapped. GST doesn't stand only for goods and services tax, it also stands for good sense triumphs. Ultimately, good sense triumphed and you have dropped the 1% tax and I thank you for accepting our suggestion to drop the 1%. The second major issue is dispute resolution. Now please remember that Dispute resolution between the center and the states 
between one state and one or more states, between a group of states and a group of states, is not a matter on which the Constitution is silent. Whatever we do here must acknowledge the fact that the Constitution is not silent on dispute resolution between states. Article 131 speaks loud and clear. It provides for a missionary for dispute resolution. Nothing that we do here can derogate from Article 131 unless you amend Article 131. And that is not what we are doing today. Which is why the bill introduced by Mr. Mukherjee in 2011 laid out a clear provision for dispute resolution called the Dispute Resolution Authority and recognize that dispute resolution is an exercise of judicial power. Just as the government is zealous of guarding its executive power, just as we in Parliament are zealous of guarding our legislative power, the judges of this country are zealous about guarding their judicial power. Time and again the judges have said, if you encroach upon our judicial power, we'll strike it down. I still maintain that the provision introduced in Mr. Mukherjee's bill was the best provision, or clearly a much better provision than the provision introduced in the present bill. The draft circulated was abominably deficient. It did not even require the GST Council to establish a mechanism. It said may lay down the modalities. In discussions with us, and I believe discussions with other parties, it was pointed out to the government that this is hopelessly deficient. You must oblige the GST Council to set up a dispute resolution authority, and it must be set up ex ante. A res mechanism cannot be set up after the dispute arises. That is the difference between rule of law and rule by law. In a country governed by rule of law, the dispute authority is known to everybody even before a dispute arises. So that you know if a dispute arises, you'll go there. If you set up the missionary after the dispute, that is not rule of law. That is show me the person and I'll show you the rule. I'm glad that some strengthening has been done to this provision. I would still urge the finance minister if he is inclined to do that, to strengthen it. There is still time to strengthen it. During the course of this debate, he can move an official an amendment. I would still urge him to say that the clause which he is introducing now, namely amendment number 7 to clause 12, can be strengthened. It only contemplates disputes arising out of the recommendations of the GST Council. I think he should add disputes arising otherwise also between states should be added. And in the first part of that amendment, he should say the Goods and Services Tax Council shall by regulation establish a mechanism. I think it is still deficient. <coughs> I'm not sure whether it is constitutionally suspect. It may be constitutionally suspect. But I'm trying to save that provision. It falls far short of the provision introduced by Mr. Mukherjee. But given that that is the best that the government can do at the moment, I would still urge him to amend that provision to say that the GST Council shall by regulation establish a dispute resolution mechanism and also include disputes arising otherwise than out of the recommendations of the GST Council. So I now come to the most important part of this bill, the heart of the bill, the core of the bill. 
This is about the rate of tax. I will, sir, presently read portions from the Chief Economic Advisor's report. The heart of this bill is, what will the tax be? It is not a matter between union finance minister and state finance ministers. There is a third line to the triangle. That is the people of this country. Every union finance minister wants to maximize revenues. Every state finance minister is under pressure to maximize revenues. There's nothing wrong with that. But please remember we are dealing with an indirect tax. An indirect tax by definition is a regressive tax. Any indirect tax falls equally on the rich and the poor. If you buy a soft drink bottle, whether a rich man buys it or a poor man buys it, he pays the same excise duty on that soft drink bottle. That is why world over, indirect taxes being regressive in nature, the trend is to keep them as low as possible. I'm sure many members have read the Chief Economic Advisor's report. If not, I would urge you to please read it. The cover tells the story. In high income countries, the average GST rate is 16.8. In emerging market economies like India, the average is 14.1. So world over, there are over 190 countries which have one form or other of GST. It is between 14.1 and 16.8. The idea is, being an indirect tax, it should be kept as low as possible. The taxes that fall more on the rich and less on the poor are income tax and corporate tax. Those are the taxes consistent with other goals which a country may have. Those are the taxes which must be your principal source of revenue. In fact, for many, many years in this country, we had a complete tax distortion. The collection from indirect taxes was larger than the collection from direct taxes. I think we crossed the line sometime in the year 2006 or 2007, maybe 2008 we crossed the line when the collection from direct taxes overtook the collection from indirect taxes and that remains so even today. And that, should, that is how it should be. In fact, the collection from direct taxes should far outweigh the collection from indirect taxes. So what do we do? We need to keep the taxes low. At the same time, we must protect the existing revenues of the union government and the state government. So how do we go about it? We go about it by discovering what is called a revenue neutral rate, an RNR. That is not the actual rate of tax. That is simply a step in deciding the slab rates. It is not so technical. In fact, it can be explained in fairly simple terms. You derive an RNR, and then from that RNR, you work out the slab rates. Suppose you derive the RNR as X, the slab rates will be X minus, will be the first slab, X will be the second slab, and X plus will be the third slab. X minus will fall on goods of mass consumption what we call wage goods, goods that are consumed by the poor people. X will be the standard rate or nodal rate. X plus will fall on what is called demerit goods or sin goods. The so-called sin goods like alcohol, tobacco, imported luxury cars, etc. Et it's a perfectly valid structure. Question is, what is X? Today, please remember, over 80% of excise duties are at between 12 and 14%. Over 56% of VAT is in the range of about 13-14%. So 
So on an average, 70% of the goods have a tax incidence of about 13-14%. But there is huge tax losses because of an inefficient collection machinery and a large number of goods escape taxes. They are neither captured by the union nor captured by the state, etc. etc. GST is supposed to be a more efficient tax. If the union captures it, it cannot escape state tax. If the state captures it, it cannot escape union tax. Therefore, it is more efficient. And because it is non-cascading, more people will comply with it. Because it is a self-audit method, a chain of transactions, it's very difficult to escape the tax. All these are argued everywhere, and I don't wish to repeat those arguments. Now, the chief economic advisor of the government, working with experts, including state government's representatives, arrived at an R&R &R of 15 to 15.5, and then suggested that the standard rate should be 18. The Congress party did not pluck 18 from the air. 18 came out of your report. The standard rate must be 18. You can have then a lower rate, 18 minus, and you can have a demerit rate, 18 plus. But the standard rate, the rate that will apply to most goods and most services, must be 18. And the chief economic advisor has argued very cogently that that alone will make it non-inflationary, acceptable to the public, and an efficient way of taxing without tax evasion. Now when we say cap the tax rate, what are we saying? We are saying this rate should not be changed by the whim of the executive. Today excise duties are changed by the whim of the executive. Three days ago they reduced petrol and diesel. Three days later they may increase petrol and diesel. They don't come to parliament for approval. Customs duties are changed by the whim of the executive. But income tax cannot be changed with the whim of the executive because it is enshrined in a law. Therefore, we argue, please now, on the basis of your own reports, cap the rate. When we use the word cap the rate, what do we mean? It cannot be changed with the whim of the executive. A rate must only be changed with the approval of parliament. Now, I ask all of you, do you agree with me or do you disagree with me on the question? that a rate of this importance must be changed only with approval of parliament. It cannot, ought not to be changed at the whim of the executive. Now I want you to speak up loud and clear and tell the people of India that we don't want parliament to change the rate, we want the executive to change the rate. The people of India expect low indirect taxes. There are a lot of people, a lot of corporates I've seen over the last few days speak up for passing the GST bill. It doesn't matter to them whether the rate is 18 or 20. They will pass it on to the consumer. And anyway, there are many voices in the government who speak up for the corporate supporters. But somebody must speak up for the people. And that is precisely what my party is doing, what I'm doing today. In the name of the people, I ask you to keep this rate at the rate recommended by your CEA, namely the standard rate should not exceed 18. I know you're not incorporating it in the Constitution Amendment Bill, but willy-nilly you have to incorporate it in the GST Bill. No tax bill will survive judicial scrutiny unless a tax rate is mentioned. So today you may avoid mentioning a rate, but three months later, when you come back with the GST bill, the CGST bill and the IGST, now called Goods and Services Tax on Interstate Trade and Commerce, must mention a tax rate. And we will repeat this demand again there. In the meanwhile, we will campaign throughout the country, appealing to the people of India to support the idea that this tax, the standard rate of GST, should not exceed 18%. I do not greatest respect, I do not buy the argument that by fixing the standard rate at 18%, the states will lose revenue. Just read paragraphs, please read paragraphs 
29, 30, 52 and 53 of this report. It categorically argues on sound data that a rate which is the standard rate which is based on an implied R&R of 15 to 15.5, a standard rate of 18, will protect the revenues of the center and the states, will be efficient, will be non-inflationary, will avoid tax evasion, and will be acceptable to the people of India. However, if the government doesn't care about inflation, doesn't care about acceptability to the people of India, doesn't care about efficiency, go ahead and charge 24%, charge 26%. So that is defeating the purpose of GST. If you're going to charge 24 or 26 ultimately on goods and services, why bring a GST at all? Your excise and your customs will take care of it. Please remember, your, ex, your goods and services, services today represents 57% of India's GDP. It suffers a tax rate of about 14% today. Or with Swachh Bharat Cess and other Cess, it may have gone up to 14 and a half. But if you suddenly jack it up to something like 24%, it is hugely inflationary. Let me caution you, let me go on record. It is hugely inflationary and there will be a huge backlash if you raise the service tax rate from the current 14 and a half to about 23 or 24. Likewise, in VAT, most goods suffer a very low rate of VAT. There are a huge number of exemptions. Only 56% of the standard rate. If you suddenly jack it up to 23 or 24%, it will be inflationary. And a high rate will lead to tax evasion. And high rate will mean an inefficient system. So I would urge the government to reflect again. Yes, we have today agreed because I believe even the government has not made up its mind of what the RNR is. And the government and the state ministers are not agreed on what the RNR is. In the last meeting that took place last Tuesday, according to our sources, according to our information, there was a clear cleavage, a disagreement between the state finance ministers on the one side and the union finance minister on the other. I can't vouch say for this that they have not agreed on an RNR. They're going to go back to the drawing board and work on the RNR. Then perhaps within the government, I don't know, perhaps within the government, there is a disagreement between the revenue department and the economics division. I don't know either. But eventually you'll have to come to an agreement on this point. And eventually you'll have to put a rate in a tax bill. I, on behalf of my party, loudly and clearly demand that the standard rate of GST, which applies to most of the goods and services, over 70% of the goods and services, should not exceed 18%, and the lower rate and the demerit rate can be worked on that 18%. Sir? The worry that we have is creeping taxation. Every government has been guilty of creeping taxation, including mine. I'm not denying that. But that is precisely what parliament is for. Taxation is the exclusive power of parliament. It should remain the exclusive power of parliament. We can give some flexibility to the executive, but eventually it is parliament which must call the shots on what the rate is. That is why I appeal to you, while today we may not put the rate in the Constitution Amendment Bill, tomorrow when the bill comes, a rate has to be mentioned, and we will, in the meanwhile, campaign and persuade all political parties and all sections of the people that a standard rate of 18% is the most acceptable rate given the economic situation of this country. <coughs> Sir, let me conclude by saying that when this bill is passed today we will prepare for the next stage of the debate the next stage is the central GST bill and a bill which was earlier called the IGST bill but perhaps it will be called today goods and services tax bill I want an assurance from the finance minister this is far too important legislation which will last for the next 50, 100 years. 
to hide behind any technical arguments. I want an assurance from the Leader of the House, the Honorable Finance Minister, my good friend and fellow lawyer, that when that bill is brought, it will be brought as a financial bill and not as a money bill. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, both houses will debate and vote. Yeah. Too many bills have slipped through the cracks as money bill. It has been challenged in the Supreme Court by one of our distinguished colleagues here. And let us see what the outcome is. But this is far too transformative, far too revolutionary a legislation that one house will vote and the other house will speak. I think both houses must debate it. Both houses must be allowed to vote. And this is something within the power of the government to say, yes, we will introduce the CGST bill and the IGST bill as a financial bill and both houses will debate, both houses will vote. I ask the finance minister that assurance and I say after the debate, after the debate, my party will support this bill but we require assurances from the finance minister. Thank you. Yes. Thank you Mr. Chidambaram. Thank you very much. Now Sri Bhupendra Yadav. Sri Bhupendra Yadav. Sammanya Upsabhapati Mahode. Yeh aaj ek aetihasi ka avsar hai ki sara sadhan desh mein नए आर्थिक परिवर्तन के लिए जो एक संवैधानिक संशोधन करने जा रहा है उस पर सर्वसम्मति से एक राय रख रहा है महोदय मैं ये कहना चाहूंगा कि हमारे जो भी संवैधानिक संशोधन है उसका अगर एकमात्र उद्देश्य है तो उद्देश्य यही है कि हमने अपने संविधान में इस देश के आम नागरिक को जो राजनीतिक न्याय सामाजिक न्याय और आर्थिक न्याय देने की संकल्पना करी है उसके अंतर्गत आज ये सदन लोगों को आर्थिक न्याय मिले इसके लिए एक बहुत बड़ा संविधान में संशोधन करके आर्थिक परिवर्तन के लिए एक मार्ग प्रशस्त कर रहा है और इसके लिए निश्चित रूप से मैं माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी और माननीय वित्त मंत्री जी को उनके उत्कृष्ट कार्य के लिए मैं बधाई देना चाहता हूँ माने सभापति महोदय हम जिस प्रक्रिया में आज आए हैं ये प्रक्रिया कोई अभी से प्रारंभ नहीं हुई है देश में इनडायरेक्ट टैक्सेस में परिवर्तन आए इसके लिए कभी 1976 में एलके झा कमेटी बनी एनडीए सरकार के समय में भी टास्क फोर्स का गठन हुआ